for two, so awesome. <laughs> yeah, apologies for those of you who didn't hear us apologizing. So we, sorry. We were in opening ceremonies and ran really, really, really long. So yeah. Sorry about that. Um, so we're Steve Bloom and Mary Elizabeth McGlynn. Hi, hey guys. Monkeys from Los Angeles, California. Yes. Uh, we want to start off on a serious note, and then we'll shift into the fun stuff. Uh, it's really important that people know that anime conventions and cons in general are supposed to be a safe place for everyone. So if you see something happening, please talk to someone. Don't hold it in. You have a right to speak. You have a right to be heard. It's really, really, really important. To us, women out there, men, all of you guys, come on. We gotta stick together and make sure if you see something happening, say something. And please be with your friends, buddy up, don't go anywhere without them, and make sure that if you're underage, don't go somewhere you're not supposed to be, and don't drink with someone you're not supposed to drink with, okay? So we care about you guys so much, and you're the reason why we're here, so let's make this an amazing event. Thank you so much. Cosplay is not consent. Cosplay. Awesome. What? Oh my Why? gosh. That's amazing. Thank, Thank you, Umbrella Corp. That's Thank so you. sweet. Thank you. Thank you so much. That's so sweet. Well, have a seat and then we can start to uh, get this underway. This get the fun amazing. underway. Yes, yeah, so uh, do we have a microphone for questions or are we just going to shout them out? We just shout them out. Shout it out! Okay, All questions time. must be done okay. in a form of okay, a let's... rock and roll song uh, or heavy metal singer. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, since you brought these up, that was very sweet. Go ahead, shoot. Let's see here. What's your reaction when you got Leron, I have to fight for that one now. <laughs> uh, I came in to read for the role of Kamina, uh, but apparently I was too much for that. <laughs> Actually, I went in there to read for the role of Kamina, and uh, I saw the picture of Liron sitting on the desk on the other side of the room, and I said, what's that? And they said, oh no, that's not for you. <laughs> and my dear, dear friend Tony Oliver, uh, who is a classically trained, wonderful actor, singer, director, he does everything, uh, he was the one who said, no, don't let him do it, don't let him do it, don't let him do it. <laughs> So I looked at the thing and I, I saw the first line on there and it said, uh, When you screw it in, give it a hard belly twist. <laughs> and, and I read that out loud and he goes, oh, oh. <laughs> And the Japanese client was in the room and all of them went, oh, so good, so good. <laughs> <laughs> so, no, don't hire him, please. And so that whole show, however many episodes there were that show, it was my goal to make Tony as uncomfortable as I was. <laughs> So there was a whole other show of really awful, inappropriate comments that I recorded that will never see the light of day. <laughs> Tony still it haunts him to this day, so I'm very proud. Thank you for that. It's still a good goal. It's yes. always a good yes. goal. Okay. Did you have a question? <laughs> yeah. Um, so uh, this is for uh, Um uh, I always wonder, because it never came up in the show, um, who is Zara's woman? Now, Zara is, is a character created for Critical Role. Those of you who play D&D might have, might have heard of the little show by nerdy ass voice actors. Uh, Matt Mercer, uh, the greatest storyteller of my generation, for sure. Um, yeah, uh, Zara's was uh, a made up uh, god called Sirius who, who sang to her through the moon. So, uh, when she, she was kept in a cage for most of her life, making a uh, fire for this awful guy that did terrible things to her mother and was absolutely, you know, tragic backstory in D&D is sort of a standard <laughs> thing. So, uh, when she finally, uh, when, was liberated from that, she walked out into the woods at night and looked up at the moon and saw it for the first time and it sang to her. And that was it. She's like, my life for you. I was instantly trash can man into the walking dude. So. <laughs> And thank you to the old people that know that reference. Yay! So yeah, so she was really, she was so much fun to play. Yeah. She doesn't have to stay in the cage much anymore. So. <laughs> no, 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 no. More questions. Yes, right there. Oh, yeah. What was it like to work on Digimon? Digimon was amazing. I know. I know. 
favorite team was the Marines. Especially, I started out with Flamethrower, the Fire of Courage, in War, uh, Black War Raymond in season two, I think. Um, but my favorite season of all, I worked on two, three, and four. My favorite season of all was season three with Gil Munn. Uh, Mary Elizabeth was directing, and Gil Munn was one of the first characters that I played that I could actually let my kids watch. Okay, so it's really innocent and sweet. And most of the characters I do are <laughs> terrifying <laughs> creatures that are ripping spines out of each other. So um, the whole process of that was wonderful. The storytelling was really good, I thought, and, and I got to be a writer for that, so I got to write for all my friends. It was really fun. And Mary is the best director in the world, so it was, it was easy and fun every set. <laughs> 50 bucks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Wolverine, man, that one hurts every single time. But I know it looks cool when the claws come out, but it, and like breaking blood and bone every time. And uh, being mostly human, I don't have the human factor. <laughs> it's painful, but it's also wonderful. I grew up in a comic book store. My grandfather owned a bookstore, and my uncle ran the comic book department. Um, so Wolverine was one of those characters that just fulfilled my childhood fantasies, getting to, to voice that. And as much as it hurts every time, it's still kind of awesome. <laughs> um, yeah, but it hurts bad, Bob. You're the best there, so what you do and what you do isn't very nice. <laughs> Snicked. Hi, Snicked. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Why do you have to choose? <laughs> <laughs> I feel like I'm both, and I'm proud of it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I'm going to have a Sasuke snack now. <laughs> That's what I loved about Orochimaru when we were trying to find... Uh, I directed Naruto for 3,000 years, and uh, when we were just you know, trying to cast... Orochimaru, it was sort of this amazing thing because the Japanese voice is very textured. It's sort of a very textured gra gravel to it. And when uh, I started directing Steve as this, we tried to find so much dynamic range from the lilting sort of sweetness that he had to that really dark, deep, scary stuff. And it was so much fun to, to sort of guide you through this roller coaster that was Orochimaru. That was awesome. I, it's still funny to me that people find that to be one of the creepiest characters ever. Because I just had so much fun playing it. But I, I haven't watched the show. I'm sorry. Uh, but yeah, that, My arms! yeah a lot of the a lot of the creepiness from the character really came from Mary's direction. And that it was it was really fun when I wanted to play him sometimes over the top, like I tend to do with a lot of my characters. She'd say, "No, bring that in, bring that in, bring that in. Just keep it quiet and scary." Because then there'll be other moments of explosion. Yeah, yeah. What we look for a lot in building a character, for those of you interested in voice acting, is what I call the highs and lows. So if you play everything high, it's going to get monotonous and boring. You play everything low, monotonous and boring. But if you can, you know, build the bridge between and this roller coaster in the highs and in the lows very specifically, all of a sudden it becomes multidimensional and multidynamic and uh, a much more interesting, I think, uh, character choice. And I don't recommend working high, guys. Don't do that. <laughs> okay, next question. Sure. Oh, Silent Hill was great. I sang all the songs for Silent Hill from Silent Hill 3 on. And what's so much fun about Silent Hill, like, we, uh, we go on tour in Russia, which is really strange. Akira, Yamoka, and I go on tour in Russia, and I realized we go there in November because uh, Russia is Silent Hill, and uh, <laughs> especially that time of year, because the sun comes up at like 10.30 and then it's gone by 2.30, like, there's no light, there's no light, and when it does come out, it's, it's cloudy and everything, and so it's very gray there, uh, and it was, it was so amazing working on the songs, because everything's in juxtaposition, you know, Room of Angel is this beautiful lullaby, that, and the lyrics are all about how you detest your mother and you're watching her die. 
you know. So it's just this great offness to Silent Hill, which is so terrific. And Akira is just a genius, and he always says, "You do you, Mary." So uh, he he's very good at, at giving people uh, like taking off the leash and just letting people run with their own instincts on stuff. So it was amazing. And Joe Ramarsa writing all the lyrics. It was really terrific. And amazing. It's so interesting to see the fans of Silent Hill 2 worldwide. She does these tours sometimes. And uh, I went to Mexico with her. Guadalajara. And I'm standing in the audience. I'm the only English speaker in the audience. And she starts singing. And everybody in the audience knew all the words phonetically. And they're, she's like rock star. They're all holding their lighters up and stuff and singing in English. It was the, the coolest thing. And that happens in Russia, too. Yeah. Phonetic speakers learn English by uh, playing the game. At this point in my life, I'm a rock star! <laughs> <laughs> okay, who's next? Yes! Yes! Turn it around. Yes! yes. Uh, uh, There's a question for you both. Uh, how would you uh, explain how the actor would know their, their range, like their, what they're able to do? Uh, that question makes sense. This, that's a great question. Um, I'm teaching voiceover classes now, so I actually had to dissect that. I had to figure out how to get to that place. Um, by the way, you can find that out at bloomboxstudios.com. Uh, I'll talk more about that later. But um, what I tell my students all the time is, before you start uh, thinking about your range, you gotta think about the acting, and you have to find who you are first. The most important foundational thing to figure out is what your natural speaking voice is when you're happy, when you're sad, when you're comfortable, when you're uncomfortable. Um, what I call the authentic, neutral version of you. I equate it to music. Like if, if you've ever seen a keyboard, uh, a piano keyboard, there's middle C. It's the key right in the middle of the keyboard. That's kind of your authentic, neutral. You can't really think about uh, going to any of the intervals until you know where that is. So you have to get in touch with who you are. And sometimes that takes a little bit of introspection. You have to go inward. You have to deal with some of your demons. It's, it's actually... Not, it's the hardest part of the work, really, is to be able to communicate authentically in your own natural speaking voice. If you talk to anybody who does commercial work, they will tell you that that is the hardest thing to do, to sound natural when you're, you know, saying a complete set of things you're not, guaranteed for life. You've got to be able to make that sound like a natural thing. Um, so to find that place is really the hardest thing. And then you, you layer that with a great foundation of acting skills and improv. And then you start playing with the characters. Always be listening for the characters. Always play with the characters. I don't want to discourage you from that because that's where most of us start doing that. But to actually get the foundations to build on, you have to know who you are first. And every single person in this room has a unique voice. So uh, you're not really competing with anybody but yourself. And that's the other thing that I try to dissuade people from thinking is that I can't get into this because of the competition. There's no one else out there like you. That's why you really want to get solid in who you are. Yeah. And then, once you've got that foundation of acting, you've basically baked your cake, now it's time to do some frosting. And that is when you become a great observer of the world and a listener to people around you. I was watching HGTV the other, uh, the other day, and the Property Brothers went in to help help this young girl. And she had a voice. We have been here. And she said, yeah, you know, this is my dad, and we're going to do a redo our game room. And I just said, like, oh. And that's when you start to manipulate and experiment with your own vocal cords to see how high you can go, how deep you can go, how nasal you can go, how back your throat you can go. And you can really start to experiment and, and find placements in your own voice to expand your range, which is a really fun thing to do. It's playtime. But this cons especially are a great place. Uh, supermarkets, malls, anywhere, standing in line at the bank, just listen to people. It's just like, oh, that's an interesting vocal pattern. You know, even like, you know, some people have a very specific way of using S's. I think Ivanka Trump uses S's like this. And Emma Stone as well, you know. So there's a very, it's, it's interesting to listen. And then you start just playing around until you find it. And all of a sudden, even if you keep the same voice, like the same pitch, you can do very different things, just technically with your, you know, sibilis and everything else, or you can do a lateral lift sometimes, play around with your hat, you know, and add texture, and you're still the same vocal range, but now all of a sudden I'm trying to be Miley Flanagan, you know? So, play, experiment, that's what it's about, but the foundation has to be acting and truth. 
And be very aware that if you're reading a script, the essence of acting is listen and respond. The specificity of how you respond comes from the context of the scene. Are you in a snowstorm? Are you in a car out of control? On a runaway train? Standing in the hot sun? But the key to acting is listen and respond. So the most important thing about acting is to listen. Because your response is going to change depending on how the question is asked to you. So become a great listener. I'm sorry, what were you saying? I <laughs> have no idea they got my plans. <laughs> uh, next question! Abstract direction, I find, is is not helpful. Someone's like, you're giving me blue, and I really need mauve. You know, so try to not be obscure when you are giving direction. I always equate directing with direct unto others as you would be directed unto. So uh, if I don't like if what I am saying to someone is convoluted and not clear, then I know that I'm, I'm not going to be heard, again, listening, uh, in the way that I need to be. So I find that the most concise direction is usually uh, the best. Also, be very aware of your actor's ego, where their mindset is, because acting's all about trust. We get people to come in and just rip open their souls and bare their heart, and they won't do that if they don't trust you. So if you're negative, or if you say, yeah, all right, I guess we'll just move on to the next one. All of a sudden, fragile ego actors, which we all are, will start to get affected, and they'll literally, the curtain will start to close, and you have run out of quarters to put in to get the curtain to rise again. So uh, encouragement without being overly kiss butty. That's a term. And uh, specificity and concise. Yeah, I, I, since you brought that up, I just have to tell you, I think I was working on Samurai Shampoo, and the director was Japanese on that, and she, one of the directions that she gave me was, okay, that's good, but harder, but more soft. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I, I did something, and she was okay with it, but I didn't understand what that was. It was, really it's, it was, it was terrible. <laughs> you don't want to know what she just said. You don't want to know. <laughs> Okay, yeah. Yes, in the back, sorry, yeah. Yes, you. Um, okay, um, this is kind of for both of you, but mostly for you. We, me and my brothers, like, we grew up on anime, and we known your voice for a long time, like from Hot Eye Silver to Princess Cordelia to Monaco from Ghost in the Shell. Yeah. And we were just, uh, we were just wondering, like, how does it, to play a character who never loses. Because like in every anime, you yeah. win like all the time. And how did you transfer to directing that? It's just like home. Just like, I never lose. <laughs> I, in my own mind, I never lose. Uh, and actually, that's a really good way to look at it. You never lose when you fail. You actually learn something when you fail. So I'm a huge fan of get out there and fail spectacularly because you will learn so much. But yeah, I was pretty lucky to play a lot of characters. Although I thought Bosch got me over and over again on, uh, on, um, uh, as Cordelia, on, uh, why do I say a Galaxy Quest? I was like, oh, Geos, very close to Galaxy Quest. Yeah, um, but even in the win, there's always a struggle to get there with all the characters, so you sort of have to look at, not the end game of stuff, but, uh, look at the process. Because there was a lot, there were a lot of failures from all of these characters along the way. So much so with Hilda that she lost her life, you know. So it's, uh, there's always a process to the winning uh, that usually comes through a lot of hard work and a lot of failure. So I'm all about get out and fail. Um, and how did I get into directing? I'm shooting Xena Warrior Princess in New Zealand. Uh, playing Pandora, the mythological, mythological character, Pandora's granddaughter, carrying around her. She's the one who opened up the box and all the sins in the world came out, except for Hope. Uh, but she, the granddaughter, was plagued to, to hold and carry around Grandma's box, as it were. So I used to have, I think I had a line that they ended up cutting was, you have no idea what it's like to be cursed with this box. Which was real fun. Uh, and, wait, wait. Um, so, uh, the horse I was being hanged on, a uh, horse named Cher, reared up and fell on top of me and dislocated my kneecap. So when I came back to LA, I couldn't do my day job, which was singing and 
dancing at Universal Studios Hollywood. So a friend of mine got me into uh, voiceover for the company that did Akira and Trigun and uh, Ghost in the Shell, the first movie. And that was it. And it was Magnitude 8. And, uh, it was that Magnitude 8. It was Zero Limit Productions and Animes. And once they called up, uh, when I started working for them as a voice actor, a couple of years later, they called and said, we have too many shows and not enough directors. So would you like to direct a show? And the little monkey on my shoulder, which always talks to me and says, you're gonna fail, chimed up real loud. And I was like, shush, you, go away. And I said, yes. But anytime that monkey starts screaming at me, I know it's probably something I need to try. So I did, and it was a little show called Cowboy Bebop. So that was my first directing game. Yeah, so lucky. Uh, and that's where I met this guy. It was Steve's first uh, leading role, and uh, so I, was, I played Julia. I was so obsessed with uh, Spike and Steve's voice as Spike that I was like, I don't care. If Julia sounds like this, I'm gonna play her. Uh, and now we're together in real life. We're all engaged and stuff. We've been friends, we've been friends for over 20 years, and she's directed me on probably 100 shows by now. Yeah. Uh, and then five years ago, we both found ourselves single and available, and the universe threw us together, and now we are engaged. Yes. <laughs> so Spike and I are running the end after that. It's pretty good. Oh, uh, dude, I, I turned to Miley during opening ceremonies and I was like, you know I don't deserve him at all, right? She goes, oh yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> you don't. <laughs> Thanks, Glenn. Okay, how about you? Uh, how, how have you ever given the, the role of um, a Tsunami? Oh, Tom uh, from Tsunami came from Cowboy Bebop, actually. The, the guys, uh, Sean Akins and Jason DeMarco, mainly uh, Gil Austin, uh, we're working at the network. They already had a version of Toonami on the air that I didn't really know about because I don't pay attention to anything. And uh, they contacted my agent and they said, would you be interested in hosting a show? And I said, I don't know how to do that. I'm an anime guy. I have a regular day job. I don't know how to do that. Um, but they said, well, just meet us for a beer. And I think it was at Anime Expo or someplace. And I said, oh, free beer? Okay, sure. <laughs> um, so I sat down with these guys, and they just told me about the show. And they said, you know, we really want to bring anime to the American audience uh, in a big way. Because it was so hard to get back then. Uh, and really expensive. And uh, dubbed animation was really hard for people to swallow. It was always the, the suburbs versus the dubbers. So they really wanted to get it to a bigger audience and see how it did. And so I said, okay, sure. I don't have to memorize anything. Nope, here's the lines. And I'm like, okay, I'll do it. So uh, I went in and uh, first day went really well and second day went really well and I just kept doing it and we became really, really close friends. And now, uh, I don't even know how many years later, we're still on the air every Saturday night, only Tsunami on Adult Swim. <laughs> Because of you guys that we are still on the air. We we were taken off the air in 2008 because we just kind of ran out of programming, and it was expensive. It's expensive to, to keep a show like that on the air, and uh, the network just didn't have enough funding to do it. And so it was like a Naruto a thon at the time, which cool for Naruto, but there wasn't any other programming we could afford. Went off the air, did a uh, the uh, April Fools event in in 2012, uh, where we took over the network when the room usually plays. And uh, the, the viewership, viewership that night went from an average of about 130,000 to over 2 million, something like that. And uh, so <laughs> we were flooding the network, we shut down their website, you guys went out of your minds that night. I learned how to use Twitter, I stay up all night with you guys, we started doing Twitter storms, and because of you guys, we are back on the air and stronger than ever, so thank you. I'm 
Are you are you asking if we're going to be in those shows? The new shows? Yeah, that's that's not up to us. Um, and a show like My Hero Academia, uh, the question is, do we have access to to audition for those shows? Yeah, um, yeah. Shows like My Hero Academia are, are done in Texas, and we're Los Angeles based. So, with rare exception, most of the stuff is done by the actors who are there. That's kind of how the industry works, anyway. In, in most animation, in anime, you kind of have to live in that city to do the work, or be willing to travel for it. And uh, yeah, so we, we've got the opportunity to... And every time I go to Texas, Michael McFarland will pick me up in that crazy little red car and he'll be like, come on, we're going to Funimation for a quick, you know, a quick half-hour session. I'm like, sure, let's yeah. do it. But that's how I got on Full Metal, where I like, got to yell at Vic Mignogna for a little bit. That's that kind of amazing. Fun. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so, you know, if they, if they ask us, and we, we can, we would. But, yeah, um, and there is crossover stuff. When they did Ghost in the Shell Arise, which is a prequel to the Ghost in the Shell series that I did, the Japanese uh, company recast everybody to younger actors, so they did that in Funimation as well for the English dub. But they still uh, called me and said, "You, I know you can't be Motogo, but would you like to play me Kurutsu? And I was just like, yeah, I'd love to. So there's definitely crossover stuff. And more and more uh, people from Texas come to LA for a little while and do some work and then go back. Yeah, or they just come to LA and stay and take over the whole industry, Troy Baker. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Laura Bailey. Yeah. We love them. They're our dear friends. They can yeah. Play. It's fine. Okay, you had your hand up for a long time. Yep. I have a question for you. I said you two part time, but what was it like to play Jake Takahashi and Mitchell B? And are they actually going to either scale stage five and final stage? Am I just going to push up that? Uh. Wow, Initial D, I, I've never seen it, so I have no idea. Uh, they, we're the last to know about anything in terms of what they're going to release and what they're not. Uh, so I'm absolutely the wrong person to ask about that. Uh, and in terms of what was it like to work on the show, it was awesome. I got to work with uh, some of my best buddies in the industry. It was really cool. I, I don't remember a lot of it because I was really busy at the time. And it was one of those shows where I didn't see the scripts before I came in. So I would rush into the studio, they'd throw a script in front of me, I'd hear three beeps, and I'm off recording a bunch of stuff that's completely out of context. So I'm glad that it came out good. Uh, one of these days I have to sit down and watch it. Um, but thank you for watching the show, dude. Yeah, it was my only memory is really just working with my friends. That's cool. Yeah, yeah. How about you? I love the glove. That's amazing. Great teacher, Oni Zuko, was an interesting, fun challenge. Um, it was one of the rare shows that we didn't have a dubbing script. Uh, usually there's a process where you have the, the original translation from Japanese, which doesn't match any of the lip flaps in English. We have an ADR writer, which is what Mary and I used to do, um, where, you, um, where you form it, so we make sure that every lip flap matches. We didn't have any of that, we just had the original dubbing script, and I went into the studio and I basically had to ad-lib every single line of every single episode. Um, trying to keep the same context, and hopefully we kept it as similar to the Japanese as we could. We, at least we had the translation, so we sort of knew. I have no idea how it played. Everybody said it came out really good. It's another one that's shrink-wrapped in my studio, and one of these days I'll, I'll get sick on a weekend and binge it. Yep. But thank you for watching the show. It was hilarious to work on. It looked like a super funny show. Um, and, and people said, despite how what an idiot he was, he was actually a pretty good teacher, right? So it's kind of manifesting in your life. Yeah, look at that. I guess it's more prestige, but um, uh, what do you think is the primary difference between acting for a show and acting for a video game? Uh, that's a good question for both of us, actually. Um, we've both done a lot of that kind of work. Uh, acting is acting is acting. The foundational stuff is the same. The main difference with video games is that you have a lot more lines to crank out in a very short period of time in most cases. Uh, it can also be very vocally stressful. So look for a game like Mass Effect, for example, I would do a thousand lines in four hours. And I'd have to make the character sound as good in the first line as I did in the last line. And, and hold that character and hold that context. So that's really the challenge there. It's, it's really um, an endurance thing with video games for the most part. Unless you're doing mocap or something else where you're actually in a completely different kind of environment, but usually you gotta get it done fast and furious as much as you can. Uh, often in those uh, games, in a lot of the games too, you play multiple characters even more so than you would in original animation or anime. 
Uh, in one of the Star Wars games, I think I counted 26 characters in one four-hour session. They just kept, okay, that one sounded good, how about this one? And, you know, you just have to keep cranking them out. So, that's the fundamental difference. Anime, you have the juggling act of trying to match what's on screen, read the script, listen to your director, stay in context the whole time. So it's, it's more of a technical juggling act. And original animation is trying to get a bunch of eight-year-olds in adult suits to behave themselves long enough to make a show, <laughs> which is what she's a master at. <laughs> it's so much fun to do. It's, I, I love original animation because a lot of the times we get actors um, you know, um, voice directing She-Ra season three and August second. Come watch on Netflix. Um, and to have the actors in the booth together is you get to hear the magic of interaction, which again is listen, respond, listen, respond in a very specific context. And it's lightning in a bottle. Sometimes you get to hit, and it's hysterical. It's the best show in town. I did Dorothy and the Wizard of Oz with you know we had Tom Kenny, SpongeBob, Lorraine Newman. Jess Harnell, uh, Kari Walgren, J.P. Karliak, Gray Delisle, and Bill Fogerbaki, and all in the same room doing the Wizard of Oz script. It was just, it's just an amazing thing. So my preference is always getting actors to listen, to, to get in the room together, because you can get stuff that you never imagined you yeah. get. Since we're getting close to time now, I, uh, and you mentioned actors being together, I want to do a little plug for something. We have seven of the Naruto voice actors together at this convention. That yeah. is, as far as I know, that's never happened before. Not since Anime uh, Expo 12 years ago when we had everybody, but it's never happened. We are all here together. Right, we have uh, Yuri Lowenthal, who played Sasuke. We have Tara Platt, who played Samara. <gasps> Kristen Freeman, uh, Itachi. <laughs> Quentin Flynn, Yuriko Sensei. Mary as Kurenai. Uh, me as Orochimaru, and uh, as Naruto himself, Miley Flanagan, we're all here. So, uh, because we never appeared together, um, we decided to design a collector's print that's only going to be available at this convention. Um, it's expensive, but um, because we have, there's the, the free autograph thing here where we can sign one autograph for free. If you buy one of these prints, you will get to get an, another free autograph um, from all of us. And it also will entitle you to go to the front of the line at any line where any of us are signing. So you can get seven autographs on this one print. eBay it for twice the price. Be <laughs> but this is what the print looks like. There, there's only a hundred of them in existence. They're all numbered. They're all hand numbered. So don't come at me about my penmanship. Uh, and you get a nice plastic slip. And a plastic slip cover for it. A so, call call for your yeah, So these will be available at, at my table or at Miley's table. And then once you get it, you can just take it to all of the other voice actors here and have them sign it too. Um, and it's an amazing collector piece. We, we love to do stuff like this because the collectors are, are rabid about this kind of thing. So for you hardcore collectors, this is it, okay? Um, and... Oh, BloomboxStudios.com. Uh, <laughs> I do want to give a little plug for that. I'm teaching voice acting now uh, online. You can do it from anywhere in the world. Uh, I have two different kinds of classes. There's one that's the, the basic class that you can be at any level. There's uh, over 30 classes that are already archived whenever you subscribe. You have access to all those classes. We're bringing in amazing special guests now. Um, Bob Bergen, voice of Porky Pig, was with me a couple of weeks ago. Uh, Chuck Duran, the greatest demo producer in the world, was there. My agent, Larry Reese, was there, who's also a casting director. Uh, we've got Eliza Jane Schneider coming up, who's a phenomenal dialect coach. So that's happening right now, um, and you can find that at bloomboxstudios.com. You can come and get a, a card at my table. Um, so please take advantage of that if you are interested in voice acting. A lot of free stuff on there, too, if you're not sure. You're ready for that. Mm -hmm. uh, we can take one more question. Yeah. Did you have a lot of time doing the voice for Vincent Valentine? Yeah, because it didn't hurt. <laughs> <laughs> it was so great because I was I was screaming a lot during that time. I was doing a lot of Wolverine stuff, and so all day long and creatures, and I was doing that kind of stuff all day long. And then I got to go in the studio and I got to watch this beautiful character on screen and just speak like this and talk about geostigma and borrowing my phone. And it was amazing. It was like therapy that I got paid for. <laughs> it was so cool. Um, can we go to the top of the hour or are we, we done? Do you have another people coming in? Are we okay to go a few more minutes, guys? Yeah. Nobody's saying no. Okay, you yeah. make yeah. somebody else say. Yeah. Sure. Uh, there was a question earlier about what's left for the character that always wins. Mm -hmm. 
I've gotten killed in my career more than just about anybody, I think. Um, I wear that as a badge of honor. Dude, I have like one third of all the stormtroopers. Talk about a short lifespan. Yeah. Um, Not a good shot. I love having, I love that challenge of playing a character that's doomed. Sultan Cool was interesting though because he actually had kind of a whole life in that process, knowing that he was sort of doomed. Um, I, I love playing, I love working, honestly. I just love working. Um, so to play a character like that, especially because Blizzard is so genius in their writing, they actually create a whole story for a character like that. Most of the characters that I do die very quickly in are like Stormtroopers, where it's like, stop! Oh! <laughs> That's it, 12 second lifespan. Uh, <laughs> but I, yeah, but there's no commitment there either, so you know that's, that's good for me. I'm, I'm good. Um, yeah, I can you mentioned the AEB writers before. Is there ever a time when you get a script and you see what they've changed to match the screen and you get to play with the words and change a little bit yourself and try to make it sound more natural? Oh, yeah. Yeah, we try. I encourage that. I mean, there's some that really want you to stick to the manga, 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 but. What they animate is oftentimes much longer than the character limitations in a comic book. So uh, to be able to get good writers in there to make it created really specific to Orochimaru, for instance, in terms of language choice and everything else, it really helps flesh out a character as much as the delivery. So, uh, so the action of the word, the word to the action, and the word to the actor or the word to the character is key in terms of character development. So. Yeah, and I found when I was writing uh, for anime, that different actors have different pacing too. So you might write in one particular way for an actor, notating all the beats, all the lip flaps, and it's perfect for one actor, but some actor might speak a little bit faster and can cheat a little bit more in, and you have to adjust for that as a writer too. You actually have to watch what they do with it and then adjust to that. And uh, the, the best actors can take any ADR script and kind of make it their own. And, and that's what really gives people longevity in this business. If they can take even a really crappy script or no script at all, like in uh, Onizuka, and uh, and create something with it very fast, because we're on a time crunch too. Time is money in that studio, and if the act an actor can interpret it that quickly and do something really good with it, and it makes it very valuable. Does anybody have a band aid? Oh, she's a boo. -boo. Just. Oh, I just have a blister on the back of my from the hamster to a walk over here. Oh, all together, one, two, three. Oh, just a little one. I don't need it. Oh, 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 look at this. I love conventions, don't you guys? I love this community, you guys. This is a global community. We all take care of each other. It's so really Which makes us you know, how we started this session was take care of each other, be kind to each other, and look out for each other because this is a place where you can be vulnerable and sometimes it gets taken advantage of. So just look out for each other, guys, because we're all a big family. Okay? Yeah. So you want to do like three more questions? Sure. Okay. You had your hand up over here for one way. The prints are hundred dollars. I know that seems expensive, but the thing is, if if you went and had them signed individually uh, by actors at any other convention, it would be really, really expensive. So it, it averages out to I calculated I think it was like under fifteen dollars a person. Yeah. So it's it's a pretty good deal. And if you're a collector, uh, I mean, you could probably turn around and sell on eBay for twice that today, because uh, this just doesn't happen when all these actors are in the room together. So. Um, we wanted to create something that was really, really special, and that's why there's only 100 of them, too. Yeah. Right. Oh my god, we have so many more questions. No, all right, let's move. We're gonna do a we'll full lightning now. round. All right, Phew. So, what are some characters that you guys auditioned for, but you didn't get, and that was just, like really disappointing? Batman. Batman. <laughs> <laughs> It's never disappointing. Um, the audition is the job. We learned that really, really early on. So if you get to audition for something, you've already won. If you book it later on, cool. If not, your friend probably booked it. And Kevin Conroy is my Batman, so I'm yes. good. Yeah. I know. <laughs> we find that there's what really is enough work for everybody if you yeah. just stick to it, you know. So be happy for your friends, and they'll be happy for you, and we get a nice community going. Yeah. And, and, and you look joking. fabulous, huh? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, yes. Uh, we'll go, these two ladies, right here. Okay. Oh, 
Well, what's fun about being an actor is that every character that we do has a part of us in it. Um, and I, for me, playing Motoko in uh, The Major and Ghost in the Shell, I'd been doing a lot of on-camera work where I was playing the battered woman, the victim that needed to be rescued. And uh, I found my strength as a woman by playing Montico. I found my strength, which is really fun. Uh, as an actor, you can actually find your own uh, parts of yourself that you didn't realize, or that, uh, and by exercising them through playing a character. So I loved Montico. I thought she was great. And Noriko in A Mysterious Play, or Fushigiyugi, who was one of my first roles, was just so amazing to all of a sudden, halfway through a series, go, oh, I'm a he. That's awesome, and I've been playing it this way the whole time, and I will continue to play it exactly the same. It was really amazing. Yeah, Spike changed my life on every yeah. level. Uh, but the character that I, oddly enough, associated myself with, especially from childhood, was JB from Digimon. He was a little guy who was kind of overweight, insecure, and, uh, you know, he just, he just wasn't sure about anything in life. I was bullied. I looked just like him when I was younger. Uh, I was very, very insecure. I didn't know who I was. I didn't know who I could trust. And so I did a lot of healing of my childhood anxiety by playing that character. It was wonderful to see that not only had I come through that personally in my own life, but that somebody could do that in cartoon form and with the love of his friends. And that was awesome. I didn't know that existed in cartoons. It was really cool. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Come Thank say you guys for coming. We're so sorry, sorry we're late. We'll see you all together.